Okay, welcome back to the Oxford Discrete Mass and Probability Seminar. Um, so as usual, um, we'll have everyone muted um, other than the speaker. Uh, and if you'd like to ask a question, please do um, ask in chat and then Christina and I will uh, interrupt the, if we think the question needs asking immediately uh, or else um, it can be taken at the end. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, Tom Hutchcroft um, talking at long range from Cambridge. Thanks. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks so much for the invite. Um, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, so I'm going to be talking about long range population. Um, so let me just start right away by saying what that means. So um, the setup will be quite general. So I'm going to have some function on ZD, uh, which I call J. And this is going to be to this intensity of my calculation process. So uh, the only things I'll assume all the time about J is that it's integrable, which just means if I sum it over all of X, it's finite, and it's symmetric. So J of negative X is the same as J of X. Okay. Now, if I'm given any function of that form, I can define long range percolation. And the idea is I, I basically want to say that I put, I look at all the possible pairs of vertices that could be an edge in my lattice. I'm going to actually make that into an edge with probability of order beta times j of y minus x, where beta is uh, just a real number. Okay. And of course, probabilities have to be between zero and one. So one convenient way of setting that up is to take this formula one minus e to the minus theta j of y minus x. But th this is fairly arbitrary. We just need to choose something that's between zero and one. And that's this one. When, when uh, y minus x is large. Okay, and just to stress that we don't sort of start with the usual lattice and then add edges. Nearest neighbors don't have any special role. We just start with no edges and then we include all the possible pairs in this way. Of course, you can you can include nearest neighbor population within the setup by just taking j to be the indicator function that x is a neighbor at the origin, and then you would get nearest neighbor population. Okay, but with mostly interested in the case where j is decaying slowly in this form. Okay. And in particular, we're going to be interested in the case where j of x decays like a power of the norm of x. Okay. Um, so we'll normally write the power in this way, where we have norm of x to the minus d minus alpha, where alpha is positive. The reason to write it this way is that, you know, if alpha was zero or negative, j would not be integrable. Um, that's fine. You can still ask interesting questions about long range percolation with non integrable J, but there won't be a phase transition. You'll have an infinite cluster immediately. The degrees will be infinite. So the questions in that regime are different. We'll look at this case where we decay like a power that's bigger than D. Now, uh, so we're, we're going to imagine that we fix J and then we have this parameter beta. So this is similar to normal nearest neighbor percolation. As beta increases, we include more edges. Okay. And we're going to be interested in the phase transition. So again, just like normal nearest neighbor percolation, we have a phase transition where if beta is small, there are no infinite clusters. And if beta is large, potentially there's at least one infinite cluster. And in fact, if we're working on ZD, there's exactly one. Now, of course, we don't know a priori that there is such a phase transition, but this question is completely understood. Um, so what happens is that in, if you're in more than one dimension, then you always have a phase transition no matter what alpha is, because you can always just compare to nearest neighbor population, basically, if you like, more or less. And this is just a standard uh, Pyle's argument. Um, whereas in, when you're in one dimension, you get a phase transition if and only if this parameter alpha is at most one. Then this is a theorem of Newman and Shulman in the, in the 80s. Now, the surprising thing is that if you might think near, uh, long range population is a more complicated model than nearest neighbor population, but in fact, there are many ways in which it's uh, much better understood that nearest neighbor population, particularly in these kind of intermediate dimensions, like three dimensions, where we really don't know anything about the critical population, hardly anything. 
Okay, so here are two theorems which uh, which are very nice. Um, so the first one uh, is theorem of Nuremberger from 2002. It says, provided that alpha is strictly smaller than d, the phase transition is continuous for long range percolation. In other words, if you look exactly at the critical parameter, there is there are no infinite clusters on the show. And of course. This is something we would very much like to know for various neighbor population in all dimensions. It's very much something we do. Long range population, at least when alpha is small, we can do. Um, and just to, just to stress the way we've set things up, the smaller alpha is, the more long range the model is, right? The easier it is to have very long edges in the model. So you expect that when alpha is very large, the model should be basically the same as nearest neighbor population, but when alpha is small, it should be genuinely different, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Now, on the other hand, this condition actually cannot be removed from Berger's theorem due to this theorem of Eisenman and Newman, which said that in one dimension, when alpha is exactly equal to one, so again, uh, we saw here that there is a phase transition for this model, but it's discontinuous in this case, so you actually get an infinite cluster at the critical value. Um, so two remarks on this. One is that there's a brand new pa uh, paper with a new proof of this that just appeared on the archive this morning by, I think it was Galvan and Tassimo. And um, another thing is that if you're interested in percolation or proof, let's say you want to prove that there's no percolation in criticality in three dimensions, something like that, you really need to keep this example in mind because uh, if anything you do to solve that model has to not apply to this one, right? It's, it's a barrier to proofs in three dimensions. And actually most things you try to do probably will apply to this model. So it's, a, it's an important thing to keep in mind. Now, just to give you a brief idea of why this condition alpha is strictly smaller than D, so where is that coming from? So one geometric uh, property that you can see differentiates these different cases is Suppose I take two different two boxes of side length n, which are separated from each other by order s, so right? They're separated by a microscopic distance. Okay. Then you can compute, you know, how many edges are there going to be, these long edges that go from one box to the other? And this alpha less than d condition is exactly telling you that there are a large number of edges, these long edges between two microscopically separated boxes. With high probability. In fact, it will be a polynomial in it. That's just a easy computation. When, when you are at this alpha equals d, you get order one edge. And then when alpha is strictly larger than d, you get no edge, zero edges with high probability. So these three regimes, this is more or less where, where this is coming from. And um, this property is really what's uh, powering Berger's proof. Um, so the way he does it is he shows that essentially the set where an infinite cluster exists is open. Uh, so you want to say if you have an infinite cluster, then it's kind of big and then it, it grows even faster. And so it's really big. And then eventually he shows that the infinite cluster must actually have sort of PC less than one itself. So if you decreased the parameter a bit, you'd still have one, but that means you were not a PC. Um, so this is nice. Um, but it doesn't yield any quantitative control in critical population because it's, you know, it really works by assuming you have an infinite cluster and then proving that you have an infinite cluster with some smaller value of beta as well. It's not telling you anything about beta C itself. Um, so the result I want to tell you about today is a new proof of Berger's theorem, which um, it's based on a completely different method and it tells you much more quantitatively. So in particular, uh, it's going to show that you have power law upper bounds on various quantities. Um, the exact values of these are not so important, but the, the main thing is that we have um, some power law bound on the probability that the volume of the cluster at the origin is large. And we also have some power law bound on connection probabilities. So that's not quite what we get. We don't get 
bounds for all x, but we do get bounds if we average over this. And again, these are with some explicit uh, powers. These are not expected to be sharp. I'll, I'll talk about this more in a second. And um, what one remark is, you know, when I defined alpha, I defined this quite vaguely. So the the um, the assumption, the real assumption that I need on my function j is just that I have a lower bound. So j of x should be smaller than some constant times norm of x to minus d minus alpha, uh, at least for sufficiently large x. Um, so this is most interesting when either the dimension is small or when the dimension is small and alpha is not too small. So if d is larger than six or alpha is smaller than d over three, then long range population is expected to be what's called mean field behavior, um, which basically means that the, the cluster of the origin should look similar to a branching running walk, a critical branching running walk distribution. Um, this is um, known in, very, in in quite a lot of cases. I'll, I'll get to this in a second. Um, so in particular, you should get like an n to the minus half here and a r to the minus d plus two here. So you know, in that case, in this high dimensional case or small alpha case, we know what the answer should be. The nice thing about this new result is it's telling you something even in these regimes that we do not understand. Uh, and the same, the, the ZD structure is not important to the proof at all. Uh, uh, you, you can do a similar thing on arbitrary uh, groups. Okay. Um, so let me just say quickly what this, uh, just translate this into a statement about critical experiments. Um, so those of you who are familiar with percolation will know that we expect critical population to be described by various critical exponents. So, you know, if you have something blowing up as you approach PC from one way or the other, or you have your app PC and you want to look at the tail of some interesting variable, you typically expect these to have power laws. Um, the two standard ones that are most relevant to us here are what are called delta and eta. These are the traditional names of delta is not small, necessarily, or whatever. Um, so, uh, and these are defined by, by these two equations. So delta is describing the probability that the cluster of the origin has a big volume. And eta is describing the connection probability of two, of two points. Um, of course, we don't know that these exist, right? That's a huge problem. Um, and we um, certainly don't know how to compute them either. Yeah. Question from Gabor, when it's not ZD, what's D? Uh, okay, I mean, uh, you have to formulate it differently, but uh, it's in the paper, uh, or I can talk about it at the end. Uh, it's, it'll be too much of a distraction now. You have to say, like, how big is the set where j of x is at least epsilon? epsilon. Okay. Um, um, so, in the high dimensional case, we know that delta is going to be two and eta is going to be zero, which means that these connection probabilities look like the Green's function. If it in, um, and, and this was proven in many cases for nearest neighbor models by Har and Slade famously in the early 90s, and uh, for these long range models by Chen and Zekline recently. And, um, and on the other hand, when you go to low dimensions, we do not expect to have this mean field behavior anymore. And indeed, let me just zoom in here. In two dimensions, we have these uh, specific, more interesting values, which are not um, due to this SLE stuff and uh, Keston's work on scaling emissions and stuff. Cool. Um, so uh, if, you, if you take what the theorem that I wrote down before and you just write out what it means, you know, if you assume these scaling exponents exist, then they satisfy these inequalities. Now, um, uh, let, let's now compare them to these, this result to what physicists believe. And actually, I wasn't aware of these conjectures before I worked on this. And it's really, um, the conjectured behavior is surprisingly simple. Um, 
you know, I, I, I always sort of thought um, 3D models, you know, it's nobody knows anything really, there's no conjectures, but actually there is some nice concrete conjectures for long range models. Um, so first of all, uh, and I should say this basically goes back to the work of Sachs in the 70s for the heating model and the conjectured picture there is exactly the same. Um, so first of all, if you look in one dimension, um, the conjecture is extremely simple. It just says this, that two minus eta is equal to alpha. Okay, so the way we define eta, um, two minus eta is always at most d, because, you know, it's like um, it's this thing here. So you, this certainly doesn't grow, so this can't be larger than d. Um, and this just says it's just linear in alpha. So here's the graph. Okay. And you can see at, when you set alpha equal to d, i.e. equal to 1 in one dimension, you get that the, the exponent is 0 for the decay of the two-point function. And of course, we know that really the phase transition there is just discontinuous. Okay, so that's consistent with that. Okay. And if you take uh, this conjecture and you use some standard heuristic relations to convert it into a conjecture for this exponent delta, you get uh, this thing where you have these two different segments. First of all, when delta is smaller than a third, we should have mean field behavior. Delta is just equal to two. And then for larger values of alpha, it should be this simple rational function. And this is open, um, as far as I know. I believe the lower bound is known due to Eisenman and Newman, but the upper bound, to my knowledge, is open. This is a very nice open problem that really seems like. Now, what about in higher dimensions? So here the conjecture is not that much more complicated. So basically the conjecture is that you have, when alpha is small, you have basically the same behavior as in one dimension. And then there's this critical value of alpha where the model just switches to behaving like the nearest neighbor model. Okay. And this critical value is supposed to occur exactly in order to make these graphs continuous, basically. So you should, if you look at this two minus eta, which is describing the um, the, the connectivity um, probabilities, this should be equal to alpha, just like in one dimension, until it becomes the same value that it takes on the nearest neighbor model, and then it should just stop changing. That's the conjecture. Okay. And similarly, uh, you get a similar conjecture with delta. Okay, so conjecturally, you, you get these sort of two regimes when alpha is smaller than this special value, the long range features of the model dominate, and actually the dimension doesn't really matter, and it behaves the same as the one dimensional model with the same long range. And then when alpha is large, the short range stuff is dominant, and the model behaves the same as the nearest main model. Okay. And then you can really, if, if you're really brave, you can look at this exactly at this value alpha c where, the, where you change from one to behave with the other, and there are supposed to be special interesting things that happen there as well, which have been looked at in high dimensions by chance. Okay. So these are the conjectures. I think this is super nice. Um, but I, I don't prove this. This is just background. But on the other hand, um, the bounds that, uh, that I'm telling you about, they're not terrible. So here are graphs um, comparing uh, the bounds that I'm going to show you, that, um, which is in blue, with the conjectured true value in red for two and three dimensions. You can see that the bounds are not so bad. And um, indeed, when you're inside this long range dominant, Zone, or at least the conjectured long range dominant zone, the, the bounds that I get on delta are always within a factor of two of the conjectured true bounds. So they're never totally terrible. But that's, anyway, that's the conjecture, and I, I think this is a really nice um, problem to be looking at. Okay. Now, um, so let me next tell you sort of a very uh, big picture overview of the proof. Um, so suppose you want to prove that some percolation model doesn't have infinite clusters at 
for the party. So that the phase transition is continuous. Um, there are basically two approaches that people have used for this problem. So the first one, which is probably more popular overall, is what I'd call the super critical strategy. So the way this works um, is that you want to say, you want to prove that if infinite clusters exist, then they have to be kind of big in some sense, that guarantees that they have PC less than one themselves. So if you did percolation on that cluster, you could dead an infinite cluster, but then you couldn't have been at criticality originally because Decrease P and still have an infinite cluster. And you know, the idea often is that you want to say, well, if you had an infinite cluster on ZD, it would have to kind of look like ZD somehow. We know that ZD has PC less than one, so this, this is roughly how, how these things go. Um, and this tells you that if you can pull such a strategy off, you learn that the set of P where you have infinite clusters is open, which tells you that. There's no percolation of PC, uh, but it doesn't typically give you very much about critical percolation itself. You can think of it, it's a bit like a proof by contradiction. It doesn't actually have to be phrased as a proof by contradiction, but it has that same kind of ineffectiveness that proofs by contradiction. And this has been, this strategy has been implemented in, in a bunch of all kinds of different settings, which I've written down here, but let's not. But what, except to mention that no Berger's original proof for long range percolation is definitely a proof in this, uh, in this way. Okay. Now, the other strategy you can follow is what I call the subcritical strategy. So, in this case, rather than showing that the set of P where there's infinite clusters is open, we want to show that the set of P where infinite clusters do not exist is closed. And of course, these are equivalent statements, but thinking about it in one way or the other is going to give us a different. Different mindset. So, in the subcritical strategy, we want to prove that there's some non trivial up bound on the distribution of the cluster of the origin set, which holds uniformly on the whole uh, subcritical interval. Okay, so, what do I mean by non trivial? I really mean something that implies that there's no percolation, right? So, for example, some bound on the probability that zero is connected to x that decays with x or something like that. Okay. Um, and we saw some similar, similar things in the, in the previous talk. So how would you prove such a thing? Well, often this is done with what's called a bootstrapping model. So the way this works is you want to prove that some non-trivial bound, that you, could, you have a lot of freedom to decide what that is, implies a strictly stronger version of itself. Okay. So, you might think that that sounds like a silly thing to prove, like it's some kind of circular reason, but in fact, this is a very powerful idea. And it's used for these kind of problems. Uh, it, to my knowledge, really goes back to the work of Gordon Slade on self wheeling walk in the, in the uh, sort of late 80s. So for an example of how this might go, essentially the way that you prove that high dimensional percolation has mean field behavior the proof goes via something like this. It's actually more complicated, but let's pretend it's, it's this. So let's suppose you could prove that if the probability x and y are connected is always bounded by three times the Green's function, then in fact, it's always bounded by two times the Green's function. Okay? And this is basically how the latent function works in high dimensions. You, you prove this implication. Okay? then it follows that, in fact, the strong version of the bound holds for all subcritical P. And why is that? Well, if P is really small, then, the, then this bound just tri or this one bound trivially holds by counting. Right? But how could this bound cease to hold? Well, you'd have to go above two, right? And you'd have to go to two, two and a half or something, that you'd have some P where it's always bounded by two and a half. But then you're in this regime, so in fact, the stronger thing holds. Okay, and it's not totally trivial, but you can make this rigorous. There's a continuity argument. So, given this implication, the strong form of the bound holds for all subcritical p. But then, by continuity, I mean this connection probability is continuous in p, so it holds at p c as well. So, bootstrapping arguments 
are strange, but they work. Um, and they, they, they can be very uh, clever. So our proof is also going to be based on a bootstrapping argument. And it's going to build on some similar kind of strategies to things I've been doing, uh, analyzing population on various kind of big groups and things like that, sort of non-standard geometric settings. Um, but, but it turns out that you, this, the same kind of ideas are actually useful for, uh, for these long range models in Euclidean settings. Um, and some of that previous joint work that was, was joint with uh, Jonathan. Okay. So one of the key ingredients that goes into this is what I call the two ghost hand party. Okay, so this is something that comes eventually out of some old ideas from this paper of Eisman, Kess, and Newman from the 80s. And it basically gives you universal bounds on certain kind of two-arm events. That, um, the, the reason it's a ghost is because here things are placed in terms of volumes, volumes being large rather than arms. And it's, uh, it's done with connections to ghost fields, which is where ghost comes from. So you think of it as a bit like a two-arm bound, but it's a volume thing. Okay. So what it says is, um, well, one thing it says in particular, if I take two vertices and I say, what's the probability that they're both in big clusters that are distinct from each other, then this is small in some completely universal way. Okay. And the specific thing you have to do if you want to set this up for long range models is you have to sum over all X, you get this three factor that depends on beta and on the on J. And then you get this probability that zero and X both in distinct clusters of size at least N. So this whole sum is bounded by a constant over root N. Okay. Um, actually, you have to assume that at least one of these clusters is finite plus all in, in the settings will apply this. Okay. And um, unfortunately, I don't really have time to talk about the proof of this today, but it's um, it's a very nice proof, and uh, I, I, I'll post a link in the chat for a YouTube video where I gave a different talk where I did talk about the proof. Um, but roughly speaking, the so the original uh, paper, so Eisman and Kesson Newman, they were this was the original paper where they proved that there's at most one infinite cluster. Population on ZD. Right? And of course, two years later, Burton and King came along with their much simpler proof and more general proof, which everyone learns today. But this paper is very interesting as well, and it quantitative, quantitatively tells you much more. So, in particular, at least implicitly in their proof, is this proof that if you take an edge in the middle of the box, then the probability that its endpoints are in distinct clusters that both reach the edge of the box. Is bounded by a constant times log n over the root n. And basically, the idea is to do a kind of change of summation where you relate this probability to an event that a certain martingale is large. Okay. Um, and then um, they did some large deviations. Actually, if you use doob instead, you don't get the log. That's why there's a log n over the martingale. They're basically the same idea. And you could, it turns out you can do everything directly in terms of volume instead of using um, uh, radio. And this, this is much better for long range models, for example, to do everything with one. Okay. Um, so the idea of our proof is going to be we want to take this universal bound we have that says it's hard to have two distinct big clusters, and we want to somehow learn that it's hard to have one big cluster. Okay. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, what we'll do is we're going to do one of these bootstrapping arguments. So we're going to assume that we have some bound on the tail of the volume that we have to choose properly so to make things work. And we'll use this two ghost inequality. And we'll somehow deduce a stronger bound on the tail of the volume than the one that we assumed. And if we can do this, as I said, we can deduce that the strong version is going to hold a uniform. Okay, so 
So here's what we're going to do specifically. So what, what I want to show you now is a proof of a weaker result. So I'm going to assume that, so in my main theorem, I had just alpha is less than D, but here I'm going to assume alpha is less than D over four. And I'm going to prove a weaker exponent. Okay, but this will have a lot of the main ideas. Okay. Um, so I'll call this exponent theta. So it suffices to prove the following. So I want to prove that there exists some universal constant C, such that, um, actually it's not universal, but anyway, it doesn't, doesn't depend on beta, such that if beta is between, strictly between beta C and beta C over two, say, this is fairly arbitrary, I just, there are some things that blow up when you go to zero, so worry about those. There exists a constant C such that if beta is between beta C over two and beta C, then for any A, I, I claim that this implication holds. But if I know that the probability that the volume of the cluster of the origin is bigger than n is always bounded by A n to the minus theta, then in fact, it's always bounded by C to minus the square root of A plus one times n to the minus theta. This square root only applies to this. Okay. So again, if I can prove this, it follows that in fact, this sort of a strong bound is going to hold uniformly in the whole interval. Why is that? Well, if for each beta we define A of beta to be the best constant so that this holds, well, we know by what's called sharpness the phase transition that when we're below beta C, the, the tail, we actually have an exponential tail for the cluster of the origin. So in particular, a, to, a of beta is always finite when beta is strictly smaller than beta c. Okay, but because it's finite, well, we also learn from this implication that it satisfies this inequality. Okay? And obviously, if it's infinite, that's useless. But it's finite, so we can re we can rearrange this and um, learn that a of beta is always bounded by four c squared. So in other words, this inequality with a equals four c squared holds for all beta between these two values, and therefore it holds at beta c as well, and we're done. So this is a, actually a very simple example of seeing how one of these bootstrapping type arguments can work. Of course, it remains to prove this in implication, which is what we're doing now. Okay. So let's define lambda of r to be the box of cyber 2 r around the origin, and let's fix some value of beta in this interval. And you know, well, let's suppose A is such that this is all the others. This we need to prove that the stronger one holds with the square root. So let's look at this event SXN, which is the event that I have control of in the two burst inequality. So for each X, it's the event that the origin and X are in distinct large clusters, each of which has at least n verses. So the two burst inequality gave me a bound on this sum of these probabilities weighted by uh, this vector. Um, so if I only sum x over this box, I can control how small this vector is. So I can bound this by the weighted one under the prefix on R. And if I then apply the two burst inequality, I get this. Okay, so here, this is where I use my assumption that j is bounded by below by a constant times x to the minus d minus over. So on the other hand, uh, and by the way, r here is just a parameter, so I'm going to choose this later. So currently r and n are just some independent variables. Now on the other hand, if I fix x, well, this is the event that they're in distinct large clusters, so I can bound that from below by the probability that they're both in large clusters, minus the probability that they're in the same cluster. And then this first term I can bound below by the square, the origin being in the large cluster, just by FKG. Right? These are two increasing events, they're positively correlated. So what I can now do is I can take this inequality, rearrange it, and sum over x. So I'm doing this in a different order to get to get this inequality right where I found the um, probability that the cluster of the origin is large squared by this sum over the 
probability that zero is connected to x averaged over x plus the sum of these two distinct positive probabilities. Okay. But now what I can do is I can bound this first term using, again, the assumption that I had on the tail of the bottom. Right, so I'll just say, well, this sum of x in the box, the connection probabilities, that's the same as the expected intersection of the cluster with the box. And that's trivially at most the expectation of the volume of the cluster minned with the volume of the box. Okay, and that I can write in this way, and then I use my assumption, I do from this standard calculus, I get a bound for this depending on it's a polynomial in R depending on the spike theta. Okay, so if I put these two bounds I get together, so uh, this to control this term and the two ghost inequality to control this term, I get that this squared probability is at most this sum of two terms. Okay, and again, R was just a parameter here, so I choose R to optimize the right hand side. And I use the fact that theta was chosen to make this work, and I, you know, I'm not going to go through the computation, but it does work. Um, and I get that this is bounded by this, this expression. Of course, I take square roots of both sides and I'm done. So, so this argument is, is actually very simple. It's somewhat mysterious, I'd say, you know, should you expect this argument to work before you do the computation? I'm not sure, but it does work. Uh, okay. So this uh, result that I just proved to you, again, we, we were assuming, first of all, a stronger assumption on alpha, that it was smaller than d over four, and we've got a worse bound here. So um, what I want to tell you about next is how do we improve this to get the, the theorem which I stated originally at the beginning of the talk. Um, so there are two ingredients that go into this, uh, which are both kind of of equal importance. Um, so one, one thing is to improve the two ghost inequality. And of course, I didn't tell you about the proof of the two ghost inequality, so I'm certainly not going to tell you about the proof of the improved two ghost inequality. Um, but this improvement has two features. One is that you can take this bootstrapping assumption and use it to improve the statement of the two ghost inequality. Um, the other is, uh, this is a more technical thing that the form on the left hand side here depends differently on J and it, it turns out that this works much better when you're trying to bound these large values of X, have a square here and there. Anyway, this, this is better, I don't really want to go into exactly how. Now, the thing I do want to tell you about is um, what we need to do is find a better way to convert volume tail bounds into two-point function bounds. So this terminology, by the way, two-point function, it just means. Okay, so in this proof, what we did is this step is extremely wasteful, right? The step where we said the expected size of the intersection of the cluster with the box is bounded by the expected size of the cluster minned with the total size of the box. This, this is a bad thing. Okay, and we'd like to find some way to do something more sophisticated. So, uh, and it turns out that the story here is very nice. There's a very nice way to get a more sophisticated bound. And um, it seems to be a general technique that was just missing from the literature before. So I'm hopeful that this will lead to nice other new things as well. So, um, so the idea is going to be to prove in a very general setting that um, if you have percolation on some graph, then the, the, um, the cluster of any particular vertex is very unlikely to be much larger than the typical size of a maximum cluster. So in particular, if you have some finite graph, then when you look at the biggest cluster for percolation, then it's going to be of the same order as its like median value with high probability. Okay, so let, let's try to make this increase. So um, uh, just to stress how general this is, let's take a step back from long range percolations. We're doing it before. I'm going to look at this super general setup where I just have a weighted graph 
but I've got these edges and these j's, which are giving me the probability of including that edge in the percolation. And, um, and I define it the same as before. Um, and suppose I have some subset of the vertex, which is fine. Okay. Then I define this quantity here to be the maximal size at the intersection of a cluster with lambda. So this doesn't have to be, the connections don't have to be inside lambda, they can go outside of my Okay. And I'll define this quantity m beta of lambda to be what, what I call the typical value. It, it's essentially the median of this random variable, except it's convenient notationally to do it with one over e instead of one over two. You could do it with one over two, it would be basically the same, and then it would actually be the median. So uh, the theorem that I'm going to prove says that completely generally, this once this random variable is always likely to be of the same order as its median, and the tail bounds are completely universal over all possible uh, weighted graphs. Okay. So here, here's, here's the full theorem. So there's in particular the probability that this random variable is bigger than a constant times its median value is exponentially small in that constant. Probability that it's smaller than a small constant times the median value is, is linear in the small constant. Yeah. And moreover, if you if instead of looking at the biggest cluster, you just take the cluster of a fixed vertex, then the probability that that's bigger than, remember this is not the median value of this, it's the median value of this, but the probability that it's larger than this typical maximum cluster size, I get this exponential term, but I also get this probability that it's just bigger than the typical value without the constant. Okay, we'll see some applications of this shortly. Um, we'll actually deduce this theorem from this uh, more general one. That this is just um, this is a nice statement that you get by doing some calculus. This statement, which just says that the probability that this is this largest cluster is bigger than three to the k times some number is at most the probability is bigger than that number lambda to the power three to the k minus one plus one and with a similar thing when you look at a specific vertex. Now there are many things you can do with this. Uh, so one immediate consequence which most of the corollaries go via is the following. So suppose I have some graph and I know that the probability that of having of any particular vertex being in a big cluster, it has this um, the, the form that we usually assume as power law, some, some minus theta. Then what this tells you is that in fact, if I take some finite region, then the probability that my cluster has a bigger intersection with lambda than m, well, I get this polynomial bound, the, the assumed term, right, but I also get this exponential dampening. If I try and go above the typical value, it starts to become exponentially hard. And the proof of this from, from these statements is just calculus. Now, there's a lot you can do with this. Um, so one corollary in particular is, again, if I assume these power law upper bounds, then I get that, then I can actually use this to bound what this value is, right? So it says, if you have this um, n to the minus theta power law of the bound, then the typical value of the maximum in section with lambda is at most this power of lambda, one over one plus theta. Okay, and you also get this averaged two-point function bound, again, with some explicit power of the volume, times two theta over one plus theta. Okay. And this is actually sharp in a lot of settings. And you 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 can use this to give slick new proofs of various um, known things. Um, so for example, one very famous result uh, that if you take a critical Hodge-Rennie graph, so this percolation on the complete graph, then the size of the maximum cluster is at most n to the two thirds with high probability. Now, in fact, it actually is a order n to two thirds with high probability. The proof I'm about to tell you only gives you the upper bound. 
but it's much, I, I think it's quite a lot simpler than the existing proofs. Um, all you have to do is just say, well, I can always stochastically dominate by a critical branching process. That gives me this volume tail bound of the n to the minus a half, right? So this is not the same then. Right. And then you, so that, that gives you feature equals a half here, you plug it in, you get one over one plus a half, that's the same thing as it says. Okay. So just, just knowing this um, volume tail bound actually gives you the correct behavior for the next one. Okay. And in fact, this should work. This should be sharp. This is also sharp on like high dimensional tori, all kinds of other things. It should actually be sharp on low dimensional tori as well, but you know, to compute the, um, Exponents there. So that's one cool thing you can do with this. Um, and more generally, you can think of this as implying what's called a hyperscaling inequality relating these two exponents, eta and delta, that I talked about before. And um, this is believed to be an equality in low dimensions, but not in the dimension. Okay. But you can see this is exactly, in particular, this bound here is exactly what we need to go back to the proof I showed you before. We now have a stronger way of converting this bound into this uh, two-point function bound, which is exactly what we wanted. So uh, how much time do I have left? Let me just turn the lights on. And do anything. About 10 minutes. Getting very quick dark in here. Thanks. Um, Okay, so I think in 10 minutes I can show you the proof of both these things. So the universal tightness and this. Let me start with the corollary actually. So again, I want to show how you can convert an assumed hour or tail upper bound into these bounds on the maximum and on the two point function. So this is just a one page calculation. So let's write n for this maximum plus six. Okay. So as before, if I fix some vertex u and I sum over all v and I sum the two-point function, that's the same as taking the expected intersection. Okay. And I can always write an expectation as a sum over these tau probabilities in this way. Okay. And then I just take this bound that I had, right, that said that I get the assumed bound times this exponential dampening. By a constant constant that I don't have. Okay. And then you just evaluate this sum and you, you, get, you get this inequality. So this is saying that this is, well, I still don't know what either of these two things are, but it's telling me that this sum of two point functions is bounded by this power of the maximum. On the other hand, I can go the other way. So if I sum over both u and v, well, this sum is the same as the expected number of pairs that are connected to each other, but that's certainly at least the square of the, the maximum, okay? And I, I know that this is of order m with constant probability just by the definition of m. So I get that this is at least some constant to m squared, right? So if I just compare, if I sum this bound over u as well, and then I rearrange, I get both the inequalities that I have. So it's a super simple. So now let's turn to this um, universal tightness thing. Okay, so I want to show that having, let's say being three, K, three to the K times larger than lambda should be as hard as having size at least lambda to the power of three to the K. Okay. This is going to be a BK inequality argument. Um, so in fact, maybe if I, if I skip ahead to the end and then go back. So what I'm going to prove, this event whose um, probability I want to bound, that this maximum cost of size is bigger than three to the k to my lambda, I want to just deterministically prove that this is contained in this big bunch of disjoint occurrences. So remember, if I have two, two uh, events, A and B, then this A circle B, it's called the disjoint occurrence of A and B. It means that I can find disjoint sets of edges, which are both, which are witnesses for A and B respectively. So the first set, Darren, just find, but, well, the set has to be open, but just knowing that that set is open has to guarantee that A holds. 
itself. So that's what it means to be a witness. And just knowing that the second set is open guarantees that P holds. Okay. So in other words, what I'm claiming here is that if this event holds that I have a big, big cluster, then I can find three to the K minus one plus one disjoint sets of open edges, which each by themselves tell me that there must be a cluster of size at least one other. And if I can prove this, this is a completely deterministic statement, then I just plug this into the BK inequality. BK inequality tells me that decrease, the, these um, disjoint occurrences of increasing events have probability bounded by the product. So I just plug this in and I get exactly the claim. And similarly, uh, there's something very similar going on when I have, when I request a specific vertex to have a large intersection. So if there I get three to the K minus one copies of this, this guy, and then one copy of this. So now I need to prove to you this deterministic event, the inclusion of sets. Okay, so this is going to be based on two very simple combinatorial lemmas. So the first one says the following. So suppose we take an arbitrary connected locally finite graph um, and we take some finite subset of it. Um, so this finite subset in the end is going to be the intersection of lambda with the biggest cluster that we apply. Now we'll just have a bit more setup. Okay. And it has to have at least three verses. So that. And the claim is that I can find two disjoint sets of edges, each of which spans a connected subgraph of the original graph. And so that if I look at the sets of vertices that are incident to these two sets, then they each have intersection with A that's between a third the total size of A and two thirds the total size. Okay. So my guess is that something like this is well known to combinatorialists, but I, I didn't know what the appropriate keywords were. Anyone has a reference for this factor if you need to hear about it. And the proof is very simple. Um, basically, it suffices to consider the case that G is a tree, uh, because otherwise you can always take a spanning tree. And in this case, you can take these two sets, E1 and E2, to be a partition of the edge set. So you want to take your tree together with this subset A of special vertices and somehow partition the tree into two connected pieces that each have a reasonably good intersection with A. And you can do this by a, basically a greedy algorithm, although it's really it's more like the opposite of greedy. I'm not sure what that is. You want to you know, grow your set while keeping both it and its complement connected and eating away as little of A as you can at each step. Right? So, um, you know, you, you fix an arbitrary root, which you take to be an A, and then you start with the empty set of edges, but you think of the root as being incident to the empty set, and then you um, iteratively construct larger and larger sets, these EIs, so that at each step, EI and its complements are both um, connected. And the way you do it is just, um, at each step, you have like a boundary vertex, VI, which is um, there's always exactly one vertex that is incident to both um, EI and its complements, which you take to be row of zero, which is a special one. Yeah. And then there are two things that can happen. Either EI has exactly one child, which is not incident to the set that you've already, of edges you've already included, and then you just eat that child, and you eat the edge that connects it to you, and, and you just add one. Otherwise, you have at least two children, which are not incident to EI. And then you pick the child that has the fewest elements of A descended from it, and you eat up that child and all its descendants all at once, because you want, you want to make sure that the complement of your set always remains connected. Okay, so, um, so if we look at how this works in that example, we start with just the root, okay? And then we have all three children to choose from. Uh, both the left and the right both have one descendant, which is in A, so I can choose arbitrarily. Let's say I take this one, so now E1 would just be this set. 
Uh, now I have to choose this right guy because there's two elements of A to the left and one to the right. So I'm going to eat up this whole three. Okay. And then the next step, I just have one child. So I just take this. Now I have two. This guy has zero elements of A, so I have to choose that one. Now I just have one, so I have to choose this one. And then... okay, so this is just a kind of positive, greedy way of gradually eating up the elements of A. Okay, and you, you stop once you've got everything in it. Okay. Now, if, um, if we define uh, BI to be the vertices incident to an edge of EI for each I, okay, and we look at the set um, of times where the set VN contains strictly more than a third of A, then we see because A had at least three elements that zero is not contained in the set, but the n time of the algorithm certainly is contained. That have, have some minimal elements. And then we just see that when we're at this minimal element, we have to be have more than A over three intersection. But on the other hand, we had less before and the way we defined it, we just can't add more than half of the remaining volume of A at the next step. So we get this point as well. Okay, and then you can easily see that the, the, the same inequality holds for the complementary. So as I said, I'm sure this is a known argument. Um, it's not really good, but it's a nice thing. So, so this tells us if we have a big cluster, we can decompose it into two clusters that are both same size. Okay. Now, what we can do is apply this iteratively. And we learned that if we instead assume that A has at least three to the K elements, then we can find M, which is at least three to the K minus one plus one, and a collection of mutually disjoint sets of edges, so that each of these sets stands a connected subgraph of D. And if I look at the intersection of the appropriate vertex set with A, then it has between the total volume to the divided by three of K and the total volume divided by three of K minus one. Okay, and the way you do that is just you know, you start with the graph and then you split it once and then you split each piece and you keep splitting the pieces until they're too small, that splitting them might force them below this volume. Right? But as long as I have a piece which is bigger than this, I can, I can safely split it. So I get this. Um, and then, yeah, uh, this, this exactly gives us this inclusion of sets. Because if this, if I have this big maximum cluster, right, as I said, I take, take A, I take G to be the maximum, the cluster of maximum size, and I take A to be the intersection of lambda. And I apply this. And I get these disjoint sets of edges, which each of them has to be a witness for, for this event. Okay, and similarly here, one of these, one of these uh, things that I split into has to be the one, it has to contain you. Uh, so I get one copy of this at least, and at least three to the minus one copy of this. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll finish there then. Okay, thank you very much for an absolutely lovely talk. Um, so uh, if people like to ask questions, please do. Uh, maybe you could um, put up a hand or signal in the chat. Um, maybe to start off, I'll, I'll ask a kind of slightly vague question. Um, but is, so you've had the sort of either side of criticality, you had this regime of, um, sort of short range domination and long range domination. Um, can you sort of say a little bit more about how that shows up in kind of structurally and in, especially when you have a giant component? Um, does, it, does, does it show up there in some way? I mean, in the supercritical phase? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that it does, but I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on these matters. Um, 
I mean, there are things about the geometry of the supercritical phase that depend on alpha, but I'm not sure that you would see this going up there. Yeah, ultimately, I don't understand this picture as well as I would like to. I think it's very interesting. There. Thank you. Other questions, please. So there's a comment from Gabo in the chat. I don't know if you want to have a look. I don't think it's a question. But... Yeah, um, Gabo's uh, suggesting another easy way of getting this upper bound on the. Um, yeah, I, that probably works. I'd have to go through the computation, but um, just the. Yeah, so you're saying that once you have the volume tail bound, you just use the union bound, basically, that if you have a, a large cluster, then at least M happens. Yeah. Ah, OK. Yeah. I, I... Yeah, so if you look at the number of, if you just look uh, right the first moment of the number of vertices that have size, mm -hmm. uh, whose cluster has size larger than uh, M, yeah, yeah. Then this is yeah, n right. times the probability. But if you have one, you have at least m. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I agree. And I think you. Ha I have also seen this. Uh, so I think even the maybe the second moment of the maximum actually is square of the first moment. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously that follows from this inequality. Yeah, but I'm saying that with this uh, yeah, yeah, with just, this uh, just deep just trick, this yeah. <laughs> uh, right. I think you can also prove that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, obviously, this inequality tells you a bit more. You know, you have an exponential tail of kind of up and so on. Yeah. No. It's, uh, Although that's the the it's less than what you. Not sure. If there are no more questions, maybe this is a, a good point for me to, to stop the recording. Um,